You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. So as I said, today's going to be the last day for at least a couple days. Um, the schedule as it stands, I could technically do a podcast tomorrow, but tomorrow is uh, induction day for my wife, so the plan is to go to the hospital and, you know, have a baby and whatnot. That doesn't mean I can't do a podcast, but I figured it would be prudent if I get as much sleep and rest as is humanly possible, you know, because at least that night, I'm not expecting much. I'm really not worried about not sleeping much after the fact, because, you know, I get up early, so, you know. But man, that first night in the hospital, it can be just brutal. I'm actually more worried about staying up late than waking up in the morning, because I'm just, I'm like a 90-year-old man. If I'm not in bed by 8 o'clock, I just start getting delusional. So the thought of possibly having to be up till I don't know, midnight, 1 o'clock, or whatever may end up happening, just horrifying me. Anyways, again, alarms are going off, I'm sleeping, and I'm, I'm not doing much. So my apologies for that, but it shouldn't be more than a handful of days, and I'll be back in the saddle, and I am taking a couple weeks off, so I'm planning on mucho, mucho content. But I thought it would be fun since I'm um, going to be gone for at least a couple days. If we tried to make today somewhat of a fun, I'm going to try to pack as much in today as I possibly can. It's only 3.40, so I got a pretty decent start. I only got a little sidetracked this morning. And so I compiled a bunch of questions, and I want to try to, I want to do as in-depth as possible. I think that's why a good amount of people listen to the show is because it's fairly in-depth, sometimes a little too in-depth. But I also would like to rip through as many of your questions as humanly possible. So I'm going to try my best to not be super long-winded. In other words, do a good job of fully answering the question, but doing what I absolutely have no ability to do up until today, hopefully, and that is to be succinct. And I'm about 84% sure I used that word correctly. We're just going to roll with it. Um, I do want to say thank you. Man, there's so many different ways to support the work that I do, that I'm, I'm really having a hard time keeping track of it. Apparently, and I guess I kind of knew this because I've seen other people do it, it just never occurred to me that somebody could do it for my channel, especially since you have to meet certain criteria to enable certain forms of compensation on YouTube, and I kind of thought I was just getting ad revenue. But apparently if I do a live stream, or a premiere, which is basically sort of like a pre-recorded live stream, it makes sense in a weird way, people are able to send you tips during the video or whatever you call it super chats and i apparently had somebody do that and i didn't know and i never thanked them and that's always extremely embarrassing and if you've ever donated to me and i didn't thank you i promise it's not because i'm a jerk i just completely missed it somehow but thank you very much to matt schroeder who um saw one of my draft videos and tipped me because the pick was good and let me just go out on a limb here not even on a limb let me just inform you that if your plan is to pay money based on a good pick, just tell me, and I'll let you make the pick for me. I mean, I'd, I'd let you make a pick just for fun and interactive purposes, but if you're going to pay me, jeez, I'll pick you for, you know, a couple bucks, man. I don't even care. I am 100% for sale. If I haven't made that clear by now, I have failed. <laughs> I just, I, I saw... Um, a while ago, Tom Grassi on YouTube had said something to the effect, I think it was on Twitter, he was saying he had this opportunity, some, I think a, a sponsor basically. And when you get up to about 100,000 subscribers, as he has, I, I have no doubt that he has people reaching out for uh, sponsorships. But he's like, yeah, you know, I just feel like that wouldn't be whatever, right? It just, it feels dishonest and like he's taking advantage of the relationship he has with his viewers and stuff. And it's like, what are you doing, Tom? Take the money, man. <laughs> Come on, do it, big dog. I don't care. You got to drop in a little ad about hair loss. You know how much money he's going to get for that? Anybody that gets mad at Tom Grassi for talking about hair loss or whatever it's going to be, come on now. That's absurd. He's done a great job building up the 
one of the biggest Packers channels, probably the biggest Packers channel. He deserves to make some money. And I think that's in his head. I don't think people would care. But if they would, just know, get off the train now. Because I am going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to pimp out this show every chance I get. Although, I do... I have turned down quite a few ads. You would be shocked at the amount of ridiculous, absurd ads. Actually, you wouldn't, because you hear it on other shows. But (laughs) I'm not doing certain ads. But as long as my children are allowed to listen to this show, I will do whatever I have to do. Anyways, now that I have done my duty of making myself sound like a terrible person, uh, why don't we just go ahead and take a break. If you're interested in supporting my work, there's uh, go to the description. There's plenty of links there. You'll find something that suits your fancy, I'm sure. But um, let's take a break and uh, get to a bunch of questions. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal, independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. So first of all, um, there are probably going to be some questions I don't get to. And because I'm getting them from every possible direction, some of them may just get lost. So I don't want anyone to get offended if I don't get to your question. It just happens all the time. If there was like one central location for questions, it would be easier to organize all this stuff. But I'm literally getting questions from like sick. I'm getting Twitter, which is response to my post on Twitter. I'm getting direct messages on Twitter. I'm getting Facebook messages. I'm getting Google Voice messages, Google Voice voicemails, as well as texts. I'm getting people responding on my Facebook post, my Facebook page post, my Facebook group post, Instagram direct messages. I mean, it's just, it gets hard to keep track. But feel free if I don't answer to just send it again. I won't get offended. Just be like, hey, man, in case you didn't get it, here's my question again. I'm glad there's a lot of interaction these days, but I am a very disorganized person. So, you know, stuff like this happens. But anyways... Uh, I do want to point out also there's some news about the Minnesota Vikings possibly moving on from Riley Reef, and I'd really love to hammer on this for a long time, but we don't have a lot of time. So let me just say, first of all, if we didn't get Rick Wagner, this would be somewhat appealing. Um, he actually used to be a right tackle for the Detroit Lions, so there's some similarities there. He went to the Minnesota Vikings, has been their left tackle for some time. He's not an elite player, but he's he's solid enough, and as bad as that offensive line is, he's one of the the few pieces along that offensive line that you look at and say, yeah, he's pretty solid. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I should probably tell you what I'm talking about. The Vikings have essentially said to Riley Reef, he needs to take a pay cut or they're just going to cut him, which is what happens when you're a team that starts throwing around money that you don't really have and you're overpaying guys that you shouldn't, which, again, to any Vikings fans, and I've had some really good conversations. There's still some people that won't stop with the nonsense, but um, I think for the most part, we've kind of come to an agreement with 
they've, they've come to a, a nice, gentle, soft landing, these conversations with some Vikings fans. Um, but for those of you that are saying this wasn't like a panic move, they totally had this planned out. The salary cap and everything was, you know, everything is all mapped out the way it was supposed to be and everything's fine. This kind of falls in my favor when you're starting left tackle, who's a pretty good football player, shortly after signing a guy to $12 million, when you have about $12 million in the bank right now, or I shouldn't say in the bank, in, in, of salary cap left, and everyone's first question is, so how are they going to manage their cap, I wonder? They turn to their starting left tackle and say, take a pay cut or get out. Eh... I'm feeling a little vindicated, just just a hair vindicated. Now, I know the long-term plan is to replace him anyways, and you did draft in the second round, I think second round, Ezra Cleveland. Yeah, because uh, Justin Jefferson, Jeff Gladney were first-round picks, Ezra Cleveland was second-round pick. And I know, I mean, right out of the gate, the Vikings apparently were extremely excited about Ezra Cleveland. A lot of Packer fans really liked Ezra. I didn't, but it doesn't matter. I'm not a scout. Maybe he's just doing so phenomenally in training camp that they're like, you know what, I, th- I feel comfortable with moving on. But l- let me just say this. Even if he ends up being an all-pro, you think week one he's not going to get absolutely annihilated by Zadarius? Do you think Ezra Cleveland, out of Boise State, is going to start week one for the Minnesota Vikings and be able to handle Zadarius Smith? I'm thinking not so much. So, I, you know, again, long-term plan, as in, like, 2021, we want Ezra Cleveland to start, that's a given. It's a scary proposition, but he's, I think he's, like, um, 31 years old or something, Riley Reef is. So I get it, but it just, it seems like, yikes. Plus, it's not like, you know, we could go with the argument that, well, they, they just really like Ezra and they want to move on. Well, then move on. They're not moving on, though. They're not trading him. They're telling him, we want you to take a pay cut. And if you don't, we have no choice but to cut you. So if you want Ezra, play Ezra. Why are you playing games with take a pay cut? You don't want him to take a pay cut because you don't want him to stay because Ezra Cleveland's better, right? Isn't that what we're saying? So I'm not buying that either. I just, I'm, I, you know, (sighs) there's nothing better. As much as it is not great, to uh, watch your rivals have good football players. There's nothing better than watching them grab talent in a way that that causes more harm than good, right? I think Khalil Mack is the best example of this. I said that it was not a good idea, and I'm glad the Packers didn't get Khalil Mack. There's no question Khalil is a terrifying human being, and I don't like that he's on the Bears, but make no mistake about it. 95% 95% of the reason the Bears are no good right now is because of Khalil Mack. They have not had a first-round pick in, like, three years. They they have had basically no picks. So when you look at their team and, and the fact that they just keep going out and getting these garbage free agent guys, I, you know, I shouldn't say garbage, it's not very nice, but they, they get guys that are not really top-tier anymore, just trying to find some level of talent, and they're slowly purging guys, and they can't replace them. Because they don't have any draft picks. It just... And I, I've even said, I kind of like some of the picks that Ryan Pace has made. Obviously, that um, pick of Trubisky was horrific, and it's going to be hard to overcome that. But, I mean, you look at, like, Cody Whitehair, and uh, who's that other offensive lineman? Whatever. I'm See, I'm going off on a tangent. I'm not supposed to be doing this. Point is, those kinds of things that fans love, I don't. I don't mind if we do something that, that is you know, manageable, but just these blockbuster type things. And, and 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 I'm not saying that Yannick is blockbuster at $12 million, but when you have $12 million in cap space and you go out and get a guy for $12 million because you, you have Daniil Hunter and nobody and you don't want to have nobody and you give away a... <laughs> so you're losing a second round pick, you're losing a fifth round pick, and you're about to lose your left tackle so that you can have somebody that's almost as good as Everson Griffin. I'm not upset by this. And if Vikings fans are excited, that's perfect. Vikings fans and Packer fans are both excited about Yannick Ngakwe. I don't, I don't see any reason to fight anymore. Best of luck to you. I'm so happy for you. You know, God bless. Moving on. So I actually got this question from Eric uh, quite a while ago. 
So I will read it in its entirety because I, I want to not take it out of context, and if I don't answer it quite correctly, at least you will have known the context and everybody can understand that I'm doing something wrong. It says, I had a thought about the signing bonus being spread out over the entire contract length. Why do teams not just sign players to super long contracts just to minimize the cap hit? And before you ask, quote, why would any player accept that, unquote, you would just include a player opt-out clause at the end of the length of a normal contract. Uh, at the end of the length of a normal contract would be. For example, if I recall correctly, the contract Kenny Clark signed had $25 million signing bonus spread out over five years for a cap of $5 million per year. Assume they had signed him to a 20-year contract. I know, bear with me, that would make the cap hit me a measly $1.25 million. Since the Packers also like to put all the guarantees in the signing bonus, the team could cut him whenever they pay, uh, whenever they want, basically. Again, there would be a player opt-out. So after the extra four years, Clark could just say no thanks. This, of course, makes sense if the cap keeps growing. It's like borrowing money, 0% interest, and then letting inflation eat away at it. The salary cap goes up, what, 8% a year annually normally? I think it's like 5-ish, but something like that. So here's the issue. Number one, um, you're, you're primarily just talking about the signing bonus and leaving out the per year. And I understand that that doesn't necessarily matter. And I kind of talked about this with the pat mahomes contract where it's basically mostly fake now i've revised that because the way that it's structured makes it extremely hard for the chiefs to actually get out of it because it you know whatever it, it's it's a whole thing i don't know but let's assume we're not doing that then essentially we're, we're it is you're talking about making sort of a fake contract in other words what you're leaving out is the per year of 16 million so if we made it 16 million per year over 20 years we're talking about a $320 million contract over 20 years. And the benefit of doing that is that you spread out the $25 million signing bonus over 20 years. And essentially, you just kind of ride this thing out until one party says, I don't want to do this anymore, because then you can just get out of it because there's no guarantees anymore. So I get it from that vantage point. Um, why not just do completely fake contracts? I think the biggest uh, couple problems. And we'll get to the, the most obvious and the most correct answer in a bit, but I want to touch on it from a couple different angles. Number one, I don't think players... So players are kind of in a, in a weird spot where they like longer contracts because there's no guarantees in terms of injury, but they also tend to like shorter contracts because when you redo your contract, it means more money, right? You get a re-up on guarantees, right? You get a big check. So basically, if, if it wasn't for risk of injury, the ideal situation would be a per-year uh, a, a one-year contract. There's a, there's been several quarterbacks and, and other players who have done one-year contracts that have just made absolute bank, right? It's not ideal, but if, if you go from one team to the next team to the next team to the next team, the shorter contracts are better because you kind of reevaluate the cap every year. So if Kenny Clark signed a, let's just play with your analogy, let's say he actually played for 20 years and inflation actually did go up, 5%, 8%, doesn't matter what it is, and we signed him to, you know, even $18 million a year, in five years, he's extremely underpaid. In 10 years, he's one of the lowest paid guys. And in 15 years, he's basically getting like veteran minimum. I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but you get my point, right? So that they're not going to want to do that. They want to reevaluate it. They're going to want a new contract. And this is all just for the sake of the team spreading out the, um, the bonus, which is not all that, I mean, we're talking about a difference of what, let $3.75 million? So we're doing all this for a cap saving of, of a little under $4 million. It's not that impactful. Another issue is, and this only applies if you're trying to get out, but let's say six years down the line, you decide you don't want to do it anymore. Or, I, you know, whatever. If you, after, after six years, you would have used up $7.5 million, right? Because it's one point, what is it, 1.25 per year. Over six years, you burn through 7.5 million of those guarantees. When you get out of the contract, the rest of the guaranteed money accelerates into um, the year that you cut them. Meaning, you take the 25 million minus the 7.5, and that's how much you owe. So after six years, and Kenny Clark is now in his 30s, you owe 17.5 million dollars in dead cap. No team is going to want to do that. Again, just to save three million dollars a year, you're making it that you can't get out of this contract until you know, like 10, 15 years down the line, because you're not going to want to take on that big of a dead cap hit. But uh, so that, that's that's several reasons. And then the, the third reason is, and this is the definitive reason, which I could have just given you this and moved on, but I wanted to give a couple different perspectives on it. It's the the 
contract language is you can spread the the money out over a maximum of five years. So if you give somebody a 10-year contract and you give them a $25 million signing bonus, you can only spread it out over the first five years. And the way that they structure that, or the, you know, the way that the language sounds, it sounds like you can, you can do one, two, three, four, or five are your options. So you don't have to do it over the length of the contract. At least that's the way that it make, they make it sound. But it is a maximum of five years. So there you go. That's a few reasons why you wouldn't do that. Uh, the next question is from Brian, um, and I don't fully understand the question, but I'm going to do my best to try to try to answer it anyway. It says, question, if the Packers draft day a sixth rounder and that player signs a four-year contract, what happens to that player if he gets cut the first year? Does he then have the opportunity to try again the following season since they signed a four-year rookie deal? So again, I'm, I'm a little confused by the, by the question. Do you mean, does he have another chance with the same team that just cut him? So the bottom line is it's it's no different than any other contract. When you sign a player to a contract, you have to honor the contract. And when you cut somebody, there's certain language in the contract of, well, you have to pay me this. So they pay the remaining amount of money that you said you would in the contract. And then after that, it's done. The, the contract is essentially void. And so if we look, for example, at Mr. John Runyon, who is a sixth round pick, it is a four-year contract, but some of that is, is uh, you know, there's all the terms and everything else. So of his four year, which is a standard rookie deal, it's four years, that part of it is not negotiable. It is a $3.295 million contract, or excuse me, that's his base salary. It is a $3.469680 million contract, but there's only $174,000 in guarantee. This is the same thing I talked about with um, Reggie Begleton, when people are saying, well, they, they signed him to a four year contract. Clearly, they really like the guy. No. They signed him to an undrafted free agent contract, which is a four-year contract. But the, the the saying that it's a four-year contract makes it sound more binding than it is, or more, you know, like we really like this guy, so we're going to give him a four-year deal. That's that's kind of it's it's sort of fake, All right? It's I found out uh, I don't know if I should say it, but whatever. My sister was given a promise ring. My wife told me this. I'm like, what the heck is a promise ring? And she's like, well, it's it's it means like we're gonna get married one day. I said, is it, what's the point of that if you're gonna? Why don't you just use the? Isn't that what an engagement ring is? She's like, well, that's before the engagement ring. I said, well, isn't that kind of redundant? Right? It's just it's just it's like saying a thing that's not really saying a thing. Saying that this is four years, it doesn't. It's not four years. It's sort of like a promise ring. We are sort of willing to have you for four years, assuming things pan out, right? Same thing. Assuming you don't annoy me and drive me crazy and make me not like you, then uh, we will be together for four years. However, just like the promise ring, there's no legally binding anything. So I can easily walk away and lose nothing more than this $14 ring that I gave you. Although I'm sure it was much more than $14. But anyways, in this case, we're talking about $174,000 is what the Packers lose. So essentially, to answer your question as succinctly as possible, if they cut John Runyon today, they lose out on the $174,680 that they basically already paid to John Runyon in the form of a check, right? When he signed as a six-round pick, they gave him $174,000 in cash. They're not getting that money back, but they don't lose anything else. John Runyon then loses this contract. It gets ripped up. He becomes essentially a free agent. And he he and his agent go around and try their best to get on another team. He does not have another opportunity with the Green Bay Packers unless the Packers decide to bring him back, which they can. But as far as this four-year contract, it's, it's null and void. It's gone. The Packers essentially have paid all the guarantees and everything that they promised to pay, and they have no other obligations to Mr. John Runyon. None. The only real obli- the the only re- the point of the contract is that it's a structure. And if you earn the right to stay on this team, then you will earn, for example, in 2021, you will get an additional seven hundred and eighty thousand dollars. Actually, in 2020, his base salary is six hundred and ten thousand dollars. So if he can make this team, which obviously he really really wants to, he's going to make six hundred thousand dollars. So he's playing for his life right now. He made one hundred seventy four thousand. He's going to make closer to a million. That's a, I mean, that's a lot of money. We think about 600, it's like, you know, for an NFL player, 600000 is nothing. Imagine a kid out of college who just got a $174,000 check 
who just needs to stay on this team to make $600,000. And if he can stay on again, he makes $780,000. That's, that's a lot of money, man. In year three, if he can stay on, he makes $900,000. Then year four, a million. And if he can crack the roster, obviously he starts making three, four, five million dollar per year contracts. Some big boy money. Although he's already making big boy money. I'm never going to see $600,000 in my lifetime. If I see anything close to that, I'm starting to talk retirement. I mean, like net worth wise, not per year wise. But anyways, that's how that works. Next question from Mr. David Davis. By the way, David, I've never said this before, but thank you very much for your support on Twitter. Every single day, David is retweeting my podcast without fail. And it's not just like some kind of auto setup thing because it's not instant. It'll be like an hour or two later when he sees it, he retweets it. For, I want to say like years now, it's been, he is just retweeting every single one of my pod. He puts more effort into promoting my podcast than I do. So I've never thanked you for that, but thank you for that. His question, what would a good season from Lazard be? I'm thinking in the ballpark of 45 receptions, 550 yards, seven touchdowns. What say you? So I don't want to be greedy, but I'm going to go a little bit higher than that. I just, I I didn't really know the answer to this question, but when I look at, in general, what wide, I shouldn't even say wide receiver two. What does receiver two get? Because some of these teams, their number one receivers are tight ends. And some teams like the Eagles, their one and two receivers are tight ends. But I don't care about that. I'm not just looking at wide receiver two. I'm looking at receiver two. The second most targeted person on the team, what is their contribution to the team? And if we don't try to set the bar low because we don't have the same kind of respect for Lazard that that we might have other of other players, which would be nonsense, by the way, we should set the bar high. And not even high, just that, I mean, you're the number two, you should act like it, period. It doesn't make any sense to say that, you know, we should, you know, Lazard should get more respect, he's a great player, blah, 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 but yet we're going to set this ridiculously low bar for him. And I'm not saying David's doing that, I'm, that's just my thought process. So I'm just going through it, I'm like, alright, what are what are wide receiver twos getting? So if you look at, for example, the Dallas Cowboys, we'll just start there, we'll go through a few. By the way, I had no idea Dak was ripping it up through the air quite this much, but Michael Gallup had 1,100 yards. I don't think Michael Gallup is all that elite. Randall Cobb, for reference, wide receiver three had 828 yards. So that's one. And I'm not cherry picking. I'm just kind of going through and thinking who the number twos are on these teams and what my general perception of them are. So if we look at the Houston Texans, and I am not by any stretch a big Will Fuller fan, Will Fuller had 670 yards. Under no circumstances, and this is in 11 games, by the way. Will Fuller in 11 games got 670 yards. Kenny Stills in 13 games got 561 yards. Wide receiver three, who missed three games, got 561 yards for the Texans. The Cleveland Browns. Now, I know they've got two top-tier wide receivers, but this is a team that was absolutely just, you know, a mess. An absolute mess. They've got talent out the wazoo, but Baker Mayfield took a step backward. The wide receivers are unhappy. The second... Most yards on this team was Odell Beckham with over 1,000 yards, 1,035 yards. So amidst the chaos, he got over 1,000 yards. Um, It's kind of wide receiver two-ish. If you look at the Chiefs, wide receiver one is actually Travis Kelsey with 1,200 yards. Tyreek Hill had 800 yards in 12 games. Sammy Watkins had 673 yards in 14 games. He started in 13 games. So we're talking about receiver three who missed two games, getting almost 700 yards. Um, If we look at a terrible team with a bad quarterback and bad wide receivers, i.e. the Giants, wide receiver two had 676 yards. So if Alan Lazard gets 550 yards, I'm going out on a limb here, and I'm going to say he is the worst wide receiver two in all of football. And I'm not super okay with that. I think with Alan Lazard's talent and with, with Aaron Rodgers being as good as he is, I'm going to set the bar closer to, let's say, 800 yards. And I don't think that's that's a necessarily super high bar. But if you're asking the question, what would a good season be? Right, I'm looking at 600 and saying that's not really great. 700, I think, would be kind of acceptable. 800, I would put in the category of good. Right, now, actual real good wide receiver twos are cracking 1,000 yards. But I will say from 800 yards up, that's pretty good. Now, as far as touchdowns, I, I don't really know. Touchdowns are a little bit more fleeting, and it can be kind of a 
you know, Aaron Rodgers has a touchdown guy. All right, last year it was our running back who was just automatic from like within 20 yards of the red, or, you know, basically in the red zone. He was just automatic. Um, you know, it could be a tight end, could be Devonte, could be Lazard. It could, I mean, Lazard could have a terrible year and still get a ton of touchdowns. He could have 400 yards and seven touchdowns just because he's sort of the touchdown guy. So I'm, I'm not as worried about that. I mean, it's obviously going to play into how good of a season you had, but. Again, I'm, I'm looking at a guy, especially if we're doing anything like running a lot of 12 with just two wide receivers. If, if it's just you and Devontae for the most part, and it's not like, you know, even share between Lazard and MVS and, and uh, EQ, which is going to draw him downward. If he's the legit 16 games, I'm, I'm saying you got to get at least 800 yards. And really, I mean, that's that's 50 yards per game. The, even when I phrase it that way, it's like, man, that's that's not even good. But I'll, I'll stand by that. I want at least 800 yards, anything less than that, and we're starting to talk about, eh, it could have been better. Again, unless we want to set the bar low and say that he's not good. But again, look, I mean, Michael Gallup, come on. That's a bad example. Some people really like Gallup. Will Fuller? So that, that's, I mean, it's, it's obviously just kind of a somewhat off the top of the head number, but I think it's, I think it's fair. So I got a question on Twitter from T. Austin. And I think I know who this is because my next question on Facebook was from a T. Austin. But anyways, T. Austin on Twitter says, Coming off of last year, we as fans have thoughts on how we should approach fixing those problems, fixing their problem. But how do you feel of what they've actually done now, now that the season is upon us? And I'm actually really glad that you asked this question because it brings up a point that I wanted to make. And I'm going to try to make the point and answer the question and not completely skirt around it. But have you ever noticed... That every single complaint about Brian Gutekunst, and there are people who are livid and furious and calling Brian Gutekunst a moron, every single objection is based on information that we don't have yet. Everything that, that people say, whether it's you or we or whoever, says about Brian Gutekunst about how he's doing a bad job has to do with players that we've never seen take the field yet. You should have got a wide receiver. Why? How do you know? You know we're going to lose games because of wide receiver? What happened to we really like MVS and EQ and Lazard? I thought Lazard was really, really good. Isn't he? Or are we, are, we're not talking out of both sides of our mouth on this, are we? We really like our wide receivers, but also they're so terrible we can't even field this team? That doesn't make a lot of sense. And we know that there's a scheme change. Do you want to wait and see how this pans out before we start saying that Gutekunst is doing a terrible job? We don't like the draft. Why? Because Jordan Love won't be the quarterback of the future because he's had six bad practices? That seems silly. By the way, I'm, I'm, let's, I won't pick on Vikings fans, even though it's mostly Vikings fans I'm seeing saying this because they're mad about our Yannick conversation. But I'll, I'll pick on, uh, I don't know, Lions fans or something. If I were to advise you, if your best line of attack is Jordan Love looks like a joke, you're doing it wrong. It's a terrible line of attack. Because the, the amount of effectiveness that's going to have is almost zero. It doesn't hurt anything. Because you're, you're working off of no information, so you sound stupid, first and foremost. Because laughing at a player because he's had a handful of bad practices, especially for a player that is intending to sit for a long time, I mean, even if he's bad down the road, nobody's going to remember what you said. So what, what, what exactly is the effectiveness of trying to use that as your argument? It just makes it look like you have absolutely nothing to work with. So don't, don't use that. Um, nobody liked the A.J. Dillon pick. We have no idea if that's going to pan out or not, but we kind of have to wait and see. And the, and the point is, Brian Gutekunst has given us every reason to trust him as a GM. He has built this team from the ground. We have Mike Pettin because of him. That, that was with his input. Matt LaFleur, who we hired, that we went 13 wins and fixed the locker room in a season. We went to the NFC Championship after being an absolute laughing stock because of Brian Gutekunst picking this guy. We have Zadarius Smith, who exceeded everybody in the world's expectations. Mike Smith, who is our outside linebacker coach, thanks in large part to Brian Gutekunst. Preston Smith, Adrian Amos, Darnell Savage, Elton Jenkins. I mean, it, it's, it's been remarkable the amount of talent that has flooded this team in essentially one year, or call it two years, Jair. This is all because of Brian Gutekunst. And we've got people saying that, that the Packers are a laughing stock and they're furious that Brian Gutekunst is, is terrible and all this stuff because he didn't go out and get some elite... Who? Who was he supposed to go out and get? I mean, it, it's almost like we, we just want him to invent a human being that's really good at why... Who? 
I mean, he went out and got Funches, who opted out of the season, which wasn't my favorite pick. But again, we don't know how it's going to pan out. Zadarius wasn't my favorite pick either because he looked okay for the Baltimore Ravens. He was nowhere near as good as he was when he came to Green Bay, factually and statistically. That came out of nowhere. I don't even know if if Gutekunst expected that. But I, I just, again, I'm not trying to skirt your question here, but I, the bottom line is Brian Gutekunst has given us every reason to trust his judgment. And I don't see any reason why we would hate a guy who's made decisions... I mean, it just I mean, Okay, so we were a terrible team. Brian Gutekunst makes some adjustments. We go from being a terrible team to a 13-win team in the NFC Championship game. And by the way, that was wildly premature. The reason that people don't still trust the Green Bay Packers is because it was so volatile, because we shouldn't have won 13 games, but we did. We won 13 games despite the fact that the offensive scheme has not even been implemented yet. The defense is still trying to learn pet and scheme because half that team, it was their first year. Basically, this entire team... For- this entire team is in their first year of learning their respective systems. Pettin is still trying to flesh out getting the right pieces for his defense. Matt LaFleur doesn't have the offensive line he wants. He didn't have the running back that he wants. Not Nothing against Aaron Jones. It's just, you know, he wants an A.J. Dillon type. And we still went to the NFC Championship game. Second best NFC team in the NFL. And he's just getting started. He hasn't even built this thing yet. We're, we're at the bottom stages of a rebuild. And basically, in... In a short period of time, we've pretty much done it, and we've lost nothing, right? It's not like a complete teardown and rebuild. We, we scooped a few players out of here and brought a few more in. Got to figure out the offensive line situation, but we're working through it. And you're, you're, you're going you're gonna to go out on a limb and trash Brian Gutekunst because you think you know better than he did because what? Guys at the draft network are telling you they don't like our draft picks? You trust those, I mean, not to trash them in particular, but whoever it is you're listening to in the draft community, you trust them more than Brian Gutekunst? That's a bold strategy, man. So I'm I'm excited. Maybe, you know, there's going to be some bad picks. Every team has bad picks. Maybe Jordan Love is a bad pick. Maybe, I don't know. It happens. Happens all the time. But if uh, Brian Gutekunst's very short track record is in any indication... I'm, I'm going to just at least bite my tongue and wait and see. Because if Rashawn Gary is really getting that much better, that's another home run hit by Mr. Brian Gutekunst. If the reports out of camp about, um, you know, A.J. Dillon and Josiah DeGuara and Kamal Martin are even halfway true, this was an unbelievable draft, especially considering everybody said it was terrible. I mean, there's a possibility our seventh-round pick might contribute. There's a possible both of our seventh round picks might contribute. Vernon Scott, the safety, and Jonathan Garvin, the the pass route, the linebacker, the outside linebacker. So, you know, I'm I'm. It wasn't the draft that I would have had, and there was certainly one or two wide receivers I wish we would have gotten. You know, I was a big Brashad Perriman fan, huge fan. But am I going to trash Brian Gutekunst because he didn't get Brashad Perriman? Nah, I'm going to wait and see what happens. So I'm I'm content and I'm I, I've I've definitely come around to to answer your question more directly of, of where I stand right now, I'm excited about AJ Dillon. I, I I listen. We have to go with what Matt Lafleur's scheme is, and I'm excited about the scheme, and I'm excited about the possibility of what it could do for Aaron Rodgers, and and the fact that it is what modern day NFLs are, and the reason NFL teams are are moving more toward this is because the NFL constantly evolves, and it doesn't evolve just by virtue of you know some natural process it evolves offenses evolve to beat defenses and then defenses have to evolve to beat those offenses you have to stay at the forefront of that nfl defenses are what they are and this scheme was was developed largely because it's one step ahead of where nfl defenses are so we need to get caught up there and so when you factor in aj Dillon is a piece of this of us becoming this sort of team deguara is a key piece of becoming you know, what, what we see with the 49ers and the Titans and these teams. And, and and again, these are teams that have taken time to build up over time, right? The Titans obviously have a new offensive coordinator every year, but they're still building off of what Matt LaFleur brought there. Right? Derrick Henry didn't break out until Matt LaFleur got in there and, and showed him some things and showed the Titans, this is how you make it work. And they took off and ran with it. You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm excited. We'll see what happens. I, I have no reason not to be. Uh, next question from Thomas Austin. 
probably T. Austin. This time on Facebook, though, from the Facebook group, he says, Obviously, we'd love a Super Bowl win, but what small things would you like to see happen with the team as a whole or player-wise? Man, see, and I'm upset with you that you put an S on the end of things because I, <laughs> as, much as, as much as I need you to say things so I can have multiple answers here, I just, I'm going to, this is going to take all day. So I'm going to try to limit myself here. I think I'll reiterate the scheme because I don't think this works if if Matt LaFleur's scheme doesn't take hold because I'm trying to think of an analogy. Here's a terrible one. It's sort of like trying to run with one shoe on and one shoe off. Right? It just, it doesn't work as well. It feels weird and you're obviously not going to be at your fastest and it's better to either, either have both shoes off or both shoes on. And I think what we saw last year, again, still a great year. It was it was the Packers with one shoe on and one shoe off. So what I would like to see is for Matt LaFleur to come out and say, we're doing it my way 100% and for everybody to be ready for that. The offensive line has to be at a certain point in order for that to work. Aaron Rodgers has to be at a certain point, which I'm sure he's already there cerebrally and understanding and all that stuff. I'm not really worried about his understanding of it, but I, I would love it if we start to see the numbers reflect more of... Um, a Matt LaFleur scheme, and, and and sort of like what I pointed out before, I don't even exactly know what that is. I don't know what the, the exact direction is. We could be seeing more of, you could just say, well, obviously it's going to be more like the 49ers, but remember, um, Sean McVay came out of that same system as well. He followed um, Shanahan around and w- was right there with Matt LaFleur and all that, and they have a fairly different scheme. So I think there's a general structure to this scheme, and then you kind of base it off of the talent that you have. Right, if your number one wide receiver is a tight end and you've got a really good fullback and all this kind of stuff, you structure it a certain way. If if you have three really good wide receivers and you know a really good running back and a mediocre tight end, you, you kind of structure it a little differently. Same general concepts, but run differently based on your personnel or whatever. And again, you've got the Minnesota Vikings who have an outside zone kind of scheme with two really good wide receivers, no tight ends that work very well. So they have you know, they run 11 personnel 25% of the time, which is just staggering. But again, 11 personnel is three wide receivers, and they don't have three that are any good, so they very rarely run that. And again, hilariously, they actually run more out of 11 than they did out of 12. Because, as I said, they probably just did that as a decoy to spread out the defense, and then would use Dalvin Cook to try to take this lighter defense and just hope they can tear that up. So again, it's and, and, and Kubiak, who is their offensive coordinator, is a similarly-minded guy. It's outside zone type stuff. So that's what I would love to see. I'd like to see the numbers start to reflect that, coming out in, in heavier packages and utilizing the tight ends more right out of the right out of the gate. I'd like to see you know more the ball getting out of Aaron Rodgers' hands more quickly, more passes over the middle, um, you know, running the ball a little bit more. And then I think in conjunction with that, it's important that the offensive line do a better job run blocking and, and just looking more cohesive as a unit, not just as a pass blocking unit. Obviously, that's the most important thing. If 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 you have to choose between one or the other, then just stay good pass blockers and terrible run blockers. I'm fine with that. But, you know, again, the way that the 49ers or the Eagles look when they're run blocking, it's just this beautifully orchestrated thing in which you just embarrass the defense. I would love to see the Packers take a step in that direction. And not only that, but also in the screen game. That's an area where they, they consistently struggle because a lot of it has to do with timing and all this stuff, and the timing just isn't quite hasn't quite been there. So it would be nice to be able to see. I mean, if you see a beautifully executed screen, that's a great, great tip-off that things are going in the right direction. So, I mean, there, I, again, I could go on for days with things that I would love to see, but let's just leave it at that. Question from Katie Sunderman in the Facebook group. She says, I have a dumb question. What exactly on the field is, quote, the slot, like slot receiver or cornerback playing the slot? So to be completely honest, there's probably a much better technical answer that I should be giving that I'm not going to give because there's a lot of nuance here. But to keep it as absolutely simple as possible, the way we generally identify it, when you have, for example, sad that the best example I can come up with is several years ago, but let's just go back in the day when we had Devontae and Jordy Nelson and Randall Cobb. Usually, you would have Devontae and Jordy way on the outside closest to um, the out-of-bounds area, right? Really far away from the quarterback. And then Randall Cobb would be in between, let's say, Jordy Nelson and the right tackle, for example. That's generally the slot area. And then the corner is the exact same thing. It would be you'd have your two guys close to the boundary and then the one guy kind of in between the boundary and the you know middle of the defense 
Again, I'm sure there's better terminology because sometimes you have three guys lined up to one side. I, I you know, I'm not even going to bother trying to deal with that. Is it two slot guys? Is it, I don't know what you characterize that, and I don't care. But generally, that's what we're talking about when when we're saying slot. It's the guy kind of in between. So, for example, Jay Sternberger, I've said a lot of times he's going to pl- end up playing in the slot instead of in line. An inline tight end is just a tight end that, that kind of just looks like a tackle, right? He's lined up along the offensive line, almost exactly in line, usually a little bit offset. If he plays 50% of the time in the slot, that means about half the time he's going to be lined up in tight, you know, where you've you got a chance to block or, or possibly slip through and run for a pass. The other half of the time, you're going to be away from the offensive tackle, away from the line of scrimmage, kind of in between the offensive line and the wide receiver. That's where he's going to be about, I'm guessing about half the time, Jace is going to be lined up there, which is called the slot. So I hope I answered that adequately. Again, I, I'm not as, if you got a coach on here, he could define exactly what it is better than that, but that's kind of just how I define it. It's the guy floating out in the middle. Here's a very tough question from Bruce EDM from Facebook. I'm just saying EDM because I don't I don't know how to how to say that otherwise. Edom. 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 Change of topic. Can you give thoughts on LaFleur and why he's not being respected and what you expect this year? Man, I I wish I knew. Because again, I, I mentioned Sean McVay. Sean McVay went to the Rams and <laughs> it's I, I, I don't know, man. Here here's here's the bottom line. I'll I'll say the media, and I know some people get upset because it, it has certain connotations, but I don't know how else to, what else to call them. The 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 national pundits. And, and sometimes this goes into fan bases, but there's just this general attitude that's just floating out there. And I think the national pundits kind of start it, and then it just kind of gets reverberated. But they more or less just kind of start a narrative and run with it. And uh, usually it's wrong, but it is what it is, right? For example, Sean McVay, he went to L.A., he did a great job, and was seen as the greatest young coach in the history of the universe. Now, obviously, that's a little bit premature. He had a couple good years. Now the Rams aren't doing very good. Nobody's talking about him. They move on and they pretend they never acted like he was the greatest in all of history. Why did they start hyping that train up when they don't necessarily hype up guys like Matt LaFleur? I don't have a clue. I think another great example would be Kyle Shanahan. Kyle Shanahan and the 49ers were a terrible team for like three years straight. They've had one really good year and everybody acts like they've been this elite team for about 15 years like this is a dynasty. They act like Sean McVay is the greatest human being, the, the the strongest, most brilliant football mind in all of football. And although I think that's fair to a degree, and I think some of his peers would agree that that he's a, a great football mind and all that, I think it's a little silly that we forget how bad this team was and the fact that the guys had one good year. I mean, when we talk about Matt LaFleur got embarrassed by, by uh, Kyle Shanahan, Kyle Shanahan's been an offensive coordinator for a, a really long time, and he's had way more years with his respective team. I mean, if he lost to Matt LaFleur, that would have been a massive embarrassment. Matt LaFleur was Sean McVay's understudy, first of all. And again, Matt LaFleur is in his first year with this team. Sean er, And uh, Kyle Shanahan is in year, what, four? So where does this come from? And and again, I, I get that, that the media and whatever is very, they're only looking at today. But then why isn't why aren't they looking at Matt LaFleur as the greatest young mind to come into football considering almost nobody? I mean, he did better than Sean McVay in his first year. He did way better than Kyle Shanahan in his first year. He did better than almost every first-time head coach in the history of football. I, I pointed out how if you add up all the wins, and I don't know if this carried to the end of the season, but through the season I was pointing out how he had more wins than every other first-year head coach combined in 2019. And he still didn't get any respect. And the only thing I can point to is is there's this weird thing surrounding the Packers right now in which they're kind of just seen as a joke. And I don't know where it came from. So my, my conspiracy theory thought on that is that for years the Packers were sort of the media darlings. You know, they could do no wrong. Everybody loved Rodgers. They were fawning over the Packers 24-7. Every time you would talk about, you know, the media pundits would get on TV before the season, they'd talk about who their Super Bowl picks were. The Packers were always the NFC team. Always. Even if it wasn't necessarily deservedly so. It was just it was sort of like the Chiefs with Pat Mahomes, right? It's always the Chief. It's always gushing over Mahomes. Everything the coach does that, you know, the greatest coach in football is Mike McCarthy. The greatest GM is uh, is Ted Thompson. 
The greatest quarterback is Aaron Rodgers. The the best team in the NFC is is the Packers. The best team in football is the Packers. And that went on for forever. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, ask a Bears fan or a Vikings or Lions fan how nauseating it was listening to the media talk about how much they love the Packers. I'm sure they haven't forgotten. And so, again, from a conspiracy theory standpoint, I think once that kind of tipped to the, you know, Ted Thompson is no longer very good. You know, it, it, you start with mocking um, Dom Capers, and then you move on to mocking Ted Thompson and how he hasn't done a good job. And then you move on to talking about Mike McCarthy and how he's washed up. And then you talk about Aaron Rodgers, and there's there's all this drama, and there's all this, you know, him being washed up. And that it's just, there's just sort of a feel for the Packers that, that they're just not good anymore. And they've, there's been so long of, of gushing over them. I think they're, they're enjoying a little bit, kind of dumping on them. And there's just this sort of feel of, of your your time is done. You know, you, you had your moment in the spotlight. We've got younger teams. We've got better teams. We've got the, the Ravens are on the come up. And, you know, people just like talking about the Chiefs and the Ravens and these kinds of teams. They don't want to talk about, you know, the Steelers, who I think are, are an underrated team, or the Packers, or even the Saints, for that matter, who are probably still, I would argue, the, the best, most well-rounded team in football. It's kind of like, eh, Steelers. Or excuse me, the Saints, whatever. So it's all these weird, kind of unnecessary and strange dynamics that are incredibly inconsistent, but it's what we should expect, right? Honest analysis says Aaron Rodgers might be taking a step back, but he's still better than the vast majority of quarterback. He has a couple issues, but he's still extremely good. Matt LaFleur has has at least earned the right to be considered one of the best young head coaches in football. If you want to wait and see how it pans out, that's fine. Uh, Brian Gutekunst has earned all the accolades in the world. He's not getting any respect. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it just points to um, the the media and, and general NFL fan bases, which, of course, you can't expect fan bases, to be honest. I mean, they just care about their team, so that's fine. But from a national pundit standpoint, I, you shouldn't expect much from them. They're just going wherever the wind blows. Right? They're, they're just interested in, in getting the most clicks and the most views and all this stuff, and they're just going to say whatever is the most popular thing to say. And for whatever reason, trashing the Packers is the popular thing to do. There's a lot of, of clicks and money involved in trashing the Packers and talking about the drama, and it's not going to work, and they're no good, and they're overrated. And that's just the narrative right now, and we just got to deal with it. And the Packers got to deal with it, and we just get to sit back and enjoy the show because... We just get to be on the other side of it for once. It's not fun. I liked being on the side where we were loved and adored all the time. That was nice. Although it did make the losses harder, right? Because when you get puffed up that much and then you lose, it's not fun. Now, everybody says we're going to be trash. We can't even get enough respect to say we're going to win the NFC North, despite the fact that we're going to clearly be a better... There's no reason to say we're not going to be a better football team. It's just, I mean, it's, it's an open and shut case. I mean, if you want to try to make a case for another team, fine, but I don't know how you do it. Of course it's possible, but I just I just don't know logically how you get there. But again, that it just is what it is. I, I don't know. It's unfair to Matt LaFleur especially. It's unfair to Brian Gutekunst especially. But again, it doesn't matter, man. We, we just go out and we prove everybody wrong. And, and again, we just got to get comfortable being on the other side of it. And if this if it picks up, maybe the, the media will change their tone and Matt LaFleur will become a darling and Brian Gutekunst and we'll just be right back on top. Especially if Jordan Love turns out to be a good quarterback. We'll, we'll have our moment in the spotlight again. Otherwise, it's us against the world, and that's fine too. So I think this will be the, the final question here, um, and I'm going to do my best to answer it. And if I can get more information, I might revisit this one because I think it's kind of a fun question. But it it's from uh, Ben Schrankler, I believe, in the Facebook group. It says, how will no fans affect the Packers or teams like the Seahawks? So... Very simply, if I wanted to answer this question properly, I would need two bits of information. How much does amount of noise affect a team, like, you know, plus or minus points or however you could gauge that, which I don't think we have that information, but it would be interesting. And then you would just have to look at decibels for each team, and that will give you kind of a number. I don't have either of those bits of information. Um, I'm... I know for a fact that noise does impact things, even for the Green Bay Packers. When I went to that Detroit game, it was very, very frustrating because the Lions consistently would rush to the line of scrimmage, especially on third down, to rip off plays. And I have no doubt in my mind they did that because, and this was the frustrating part, Packers fans, and maybe this is normal, I don't know, it took forever, forever for them to get up to volume. So I just didn't sit down. I stayed standing, and I stayed screaming. The rest of the stadium 
I mean, it was like they'd break the huddle and then people would start standing up and they'd start getting louder. And you would just hope that it would be like a nine count before they snapped the ball because then it would be really loud. And, and every time it got up to volume, it was like a sack or a big play by the defense. They, they did a really good job. But usually what the Lions started doing is they would just break the huddle quickly, get to the line of scrimmage, get the playoff, and Packer fans haven't even set their beer down yet. So there clearly was an impact. But then the question is, what is sort of the base? I, I think what the Packers have is what most fan, what teams have, right? The the noise helps the the defense in two ways. It pumps up the defense as well as makes it hard for the offense to hear. There, there's sort of a baseline for every team, and I, I guess I'd break it into three categories. There are teams that don't have that who are going to be helped the most. For example, the Chargers. I don't think there's really any noise for them. So this kind of brings everything down to their level. Then there's sort of a baseline where I think you have Packers and some other teams where there's noise, but it's not like earth-shattering noise, which is going to be negatively impacting the Packers' defense. But again, it, it's sort of, with the exception of like two teams, everybody's going to be impacted the exact same way. And I don't think the Chargers have a chance of winning the Super Bowl anyway, so I'm not worried about that. But the teams that are most affected are the teams that kind of depend on it. There are certain teams who have sort of unfairly done things to make noise a massive part of, of what they do that I think are genuinely going to be hurt by this. The Minnesota Vikings are one of those teams. They've got that dome. It's a very loud stadium. They've got their horn, which I'm sure they're still going to be blaring that stupid horn. And, and again, the, the baseline actually might not change all that much for the Green Bay Packers because they are piping in noise. And I think they're probably going to at least pipe in noise to that level. But again, I, I don't think they're going to match the intensity of certain stadiums. So I'm, I'm excited about the fact that I think the Vikings are going to be hurt. Obviously, the Seahawks at CenturyLink are going to be hurt by the, the lack of noise because clearly they are benefited by that. There is there is a ridiculous amount of noise. The Kansas City Chiefs actually broke a record for the loudest stadium, I think 142 decibels or something like that, which is like a jet engine taking off. It's 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 uh, you know severe ear damage type noise. So they're going to be very much hurt by that. So I'm, I'm, I'm not super worried about it. The Packers actually have a pretty bad reputation. They had a whole campaign about, you know, get loud Lambo because the Packers had a reputation for not getting loud. They don't make enough noise. There's that whole Midwest nice where it's like, well, I don't want to be rude to my neighbor here. And you got the old folks saying, keep it down and sit down and I can't see and all that and just nonsense to the point where you feel uncomfortable making noise at a football game and standing. I did. I did it anyway. Completely lost my voice for like a week. And I'm proud that I did that, but it does make you feel uncomfortable because nobody's standing, right? Once, I mean, you only are allowed to stand on third down, which is absurd. Even then, some people are going to get huffy and you shouldn't stand right away. You got to wait until they break the huddle. Then you can slowly start to stand and start kind of making noise. But you don't want to be the first person to make noise because that's embarrassing. (laughs) No, what's embarrassing is the people at the stadium who are too embarrassed and too polite to help the team win football games. Anyways, I'm not going down that path. But I don't think the Packers are going to be negatively impacted. I think the, the piped-in noise, whatever that's going to be, is going to be at least as loud as what the Packer fans can put out, which is not very much. I know I saw the decibel thing. I, it, it, I think it grazed 100 once when I was there. But again, compared to like the Chiefs at 142 decibels or the, the Seahawks at probably 120, 130 consistently, uh, those are the teams that are going to be hurt the most. The Vikings, you know, teams that construct these domes that are largely constructed to make sure that it's just as loud as is humanly possible. You have four people in there whispering to each other and it registers like a hundred decibels because of the construction of the, the stadiums. So I'm actually, I'm, I'm excited from that standpoint. I, I, th- I think it levels the playing field a bit. Everybody has equally sounding decibel and I hope that's how they're doing it. Not we, we turn up the, the piped in noise to a certain level because again, some stadiums have echo more than others and that's going to make it louder at some stadiums than others, which is stupid. You should be turning it up to register an, a certain amount of decibels on the field. That should be how they're doing it. And if it's not how they're doing it, they're doing it wrong. There's no reason to pipe in noise louder in one stadium than the other. And if you have to turn it down more at one stadium because of the construction of their stadium, then turn it down. Like giving teams an unfair advantage with piped in noise, that's stupid because they spent a billion dollars constructing this monstrosity of a stadium. Cool. Don't care. Sorry, you have to learn how to actually win by playing football well, not because you're making the quarterback's ears bleed. Ha ha, you don't know the play because you can't hear it. Nah, nah, nah. No, sorry, you just have to be better at football today. But anyways, I got to get going. Sorry to the handful of people whose questions I didn't get to. Kind of just going in order, and this is where we're going to have to cut it off. Thank you to everybody for uh, reaching out with your questions. 
Again, if you have a question and I didn't get to it, it's probably best if you just send it to me again. Um, and ideally, let's try to keep it in one place. So if you could text the phone number that I have listed in the comment section. Just send a text message or a voicemail if you choose. That'll make it easier because then I can just go to one place. I'll try to look in other places, but you know, on Facebook it's going to get buried. Twitter it's going to get buried. Text messages are just there, and there's just a list of them, and if it's a list of questions, that makes it easier for me. But otherwise, uh, you folks have yourselves a great day. I will be back on here probably, I don't know, Saturday-ish, Friday-ish, I don't know. We'll see. Talk to you in a few days. Bye-bye.